Hello, in the second video of three, we're going to continue looking at the difference between two sheets of Giant Dragon Max Spin, one with a 2mm sponge, one with a 2.2mm sponge. Only this time we're going to be comparing maximum throw height, ball flight trajectory and rebound speed where the rubber is stationary at impact with a moving ball. To carry out these tests, I use Busfly Free Shack to glue the 2.2mm sponge version to one side of glass, which is approximately 7mm thick and the 2mm version to the other side. 2mm. Now I use the sheet of glass because A, being a flat hard surface, it's easier for me to clamp into the suction vice I use than a table tennis bat's handle, which B, makes it easier to control the angle the rubber is set at. C, the glass is more versatile because being clear it allows me to fill in the back of the sponge at impact. And D, I can clip a microphone near to the rubber surface so I can record the impact of the ball on the rubber. Once the rubbers were glued onto the glass and clamped into a suction vise, I placed them at the end of a table tennis table and table tennis balls were fired at the rubber using a TT-Matic 500 robot. For all of these tests the speed rating on the robot was set to maximum because we're primarily interested in the sponge and I wanted the ball to penetrate the actual top sheet and get to that sponge as often as possible. Test 1. Maximum throw height and flight trajectory. Rubbers 90 degree angle to the table, robot setting maximum speed, Minimum spin. By tracking each ball's trajectory and marking the point at which the ball reached its maximum height, you can see that both the 2.2 and 2mm sponge versions generated a similar maximum height, but the ball rebounded from the 2.2mm sponge version consistently nearer to the point of contact of ball on rubber, both in terms of straight line distance and actual distance travelled by the rebounding ball. By the time the ball reached the end of the table, the difference in the height is far more obvious. The balls rebounding from the 2.2mm sponge version have either dipped or died or stalled, whatever way you want to describe it, far more so than the 2mm sponge version. To put this into perspective, consider this footage from another camera which I had placed at the end of the table and filming the same balls. Here you can see them clearing the collecting net and hitting the back wall. The balls rebounding from the 2mm sponge version are travelling significantly further past the end of the table. So, with the robot setting set to maximum speed and minimum spin, the maximum height that the ball reached was very similar off both of these sponge versions. However, with the 2mm sponge version, the actual flight path appears shallower because the ball is actually travelling a lot further in relation to the actual table height. Test 2. Maximum throw height and flight trajectory. Rubbers, 90 degree angle to the table. Robot setting maximum speed, maximum spin. Using the same testing and analysis as before, I plotted the point at which each ball reached its maximum height. Once again, the balls rebounding from both the 2 and 2.2mm sponge versions, reaching a similar maximum height. But the balls rebounding from the 2.2mm version did so nearer to the point of contact of ball on rubber, and descended back to the table height sooner. Once again, the maximum throw height reached by the ball is similar for both sponge versions but the trajectory is still longer for the 2mm sponge. 3. Block test. Maximum throw height and flight trajectory. Rubbers at 62 degree angle to the table. Robot settings maximum speed and both maximum and minimum spin. But most players using inverted rubber don't block the ball back with a bat angle of 90 degrees. They'll actually close that bat angle, as the ball would generally fly high and long as you can see here. So, I repeated these tests and set the angle of the glass to 62 degrees from the table. This was the angle at which I found the 2.2mm version, capable of both consistently blocking balls fired at it over the net, but also still landing on the other side of the table, both with a robot setting of maximum and minimum spin. Watching this back, you can see that the ball rebounding of the 2mm sponge version either clips the net or hits the net and fails to go over on quite a few occasions. All the balls rebounded from the 2.2mm spun version cleared the net. By tracking the flight of the balls and marking the point at which the ball reaches the net, you can clearly see that the height of the ball at the net is consistently higher for the 2.2mm spun version. Once past the net, the balls from the 2.2mm spun version bounce just slightly further typically than those from the 2mm one. And by the time the balls cross the end of the table, the balls have typically bounced higher from the 2.2mm spun version. This would seem to suggest that the 2mm sponge version is capable of generating a more awkward, flatter, skiddier ball for an opponent. 
but the downside is that with a flatter trajectory that's still going a similar distance, it's harder to get it over the net and back down on the other side of the table. Now some of you might be thinking the reason for this flatter trajectory is that with the 2.2mm sponge version, there's more topspin coming off the ball so it goes up and comes down in a greater arc. But that's not necessarily the case, not in our tests. Using high speed footage you can see that when the rubber is set to a 90 degree angle to the table and I feed the ball onto the rubber, the ball has topspin on. After making contact with the rubber, the ball changes direction but the rotation of the ball remains unchanged. It continues to rotate in a clockwise direction, which is the equivalent of backspin, not topspin. So if anything, it's the backspin on the ball which helps contribute to the shallower trajectory from the 2mm sponge version. Almost like the ball is gliding or hovering in the air and works against the 2.2mm version because with its steeper angle, it stalls and comes back down. With the bat angle reduced to 62 degrees for the blocking tests, the ball again approaches the rubber spinning in a clockwise direction, i.e. topspin. But this time on contact with the rubber, the ball stops rotating and rebounds with float, or very slight topspin. This is maybe why the balls rebounded marginally further in the rebound test of the 2.2mm sponge version, which has a slightly higher trajectory. And so the ball has slightly further to fall before it hits the table. And when the ball is fed directly onto the rubber without bouncing, the ball again approaches spinning clockwise, i.e. topspin, but after making contact with the rubber, returns spinning anti-clockwise, again topspin. This is an example of true reversal. Interestingly then, the bat angle will have an impact not just on the amount of spin that's generated, but also the type of spin. And it's one of the reasons why we don't try and measure the amounts of spin which are generated in our tests. There are just too many factors involved, and we'll come back to that later on in this video. Four. Speed tests. For consistency, I used the same footage as before for analysis, and again tracked the balls as they rebounded at the same time from overlaid video of both the 2 and 2.2mm sponge versions, and stopped the video at the point when the first ball crossed the net line. Here I marked where each ball was in relation to the other. This was repeated each time a ball was fired by the robot, and the results collated. In terms of straight line rebound speed, the 2mm sponge version was typically marginally quicker to the net. This difference becomes greater by the time the ball reaches the end of the table, and was true when the robot settings were set to both maximum and minimum spin. The speed results were also similar for the blocking test, only this time the difference wasn't as big. Whether this is because in blocking tests the angle of impact between the ball and rubber is more direct or head on, and so energy or speed is created and transferred differently, I don't know and I'll leave that up to the experts to explain. So to sum up, the ball bouncing back off the 2mm sponge version was quicker than the ball rebounding back off the 2.2mm sponge version, and this difference in speed was more marked when the bat angle was open with a glancing blow than when it was closed. At this point, I think it's important to point out though the problems and limitations of our tests and the results that we got from them. 1. Although we have tried to establish general trends by repeating ball feeds, this really needs to be done many, many more times than we were able to do so. And two, the fact that there are variations within the same test scenarios suggests there are other factors impacting on our test results. The three main ones that I have are firstly the speed the film is shot at, and the film you've seen so far has either been shot at 25 or 30 frames per second. However, as you can see, the amount of time it takes for the ball to rebound off this rubber and get to the other end of the table it's only 1.04 seconds, or 26 frames, to cover an approximate distance of 270 centimetres. When the rubber angle is closed for blocking, the time taken is 0.64 seconds, or 16 frames, and that's approximately 17 centimetres for every frame you see, and that means the ball becomes stretched visibly on the screen. And it's these gaps which leave room for interpretation. And a why when you see graphics such as this one, the balls which across the net line are not always in a straight line directly over the net. If the comparative images didn't stop on the net line, I've had to plot the next visible point that they've appeared. Fortunately, it's not the same problem when tracking the trajectory of the ball, as the software I use, a very handy freeware program called Kenovia, big thank you to Kenovia for all the hard work, automatically estimates the path travelled by an object, one that I select to track, and this smooths out the gap in the film, giving a constant trajectory path. My only job is to check the frame by frame that Canovia doesn't lose track of the object, or where it does, to put it back on track. 2. 
variations in feed from the TT Matic 500. Over time, the foam around the feed mechanism on the TT Matic experiences normal wear and tear. Coupled with possible slight differences in the hardness and wear of each ball used, and you can get slight variations in both speed, spin and trajectory being delivered by the robot. You can see these variations here, where the ball lands at different points on the table. So our question now isn't whether these factors have affected our results, but rather by how much. To test this, I went through each video I'd shot frame by frame, trying to find comparable footage for each scenario, where as close as possible, the ball 1 took the same amount of time to travel from the robot to the rubber, and 2 covered as close as possible the same amount of distance, 3 followed a similar flight path, 4 bounced in the same place on the table, and 5 made contact on the same place on the rubber surface. The results confirm the general observations that we've seen earlier, except 1, and that's to do with the maximum height. When the robot settings were set to maximum spin, it was a 2.2mm sponge version which gave a marginally higher maximum height. When the robot settings were set to minimum spin, it was a 2mm sponge version which generated the maximum height. And that seems to suggest that the spin seems to act better with a thicker sponge. In terms of the blocking test, whether it's nearer to the bat, medium distance or further back, the results are consistent with their earlier tests. But, and it's a big but, there's still one factor that we need to take into account, and it's one that's outside the control of all table tennis players, and that's variations in the table tennis rubber itself, variations that come from the manufacturer. Those of you who've seen the first video in this series will know that I picked these two sheets of giant dragon max spin on the basis that the only difference would be the thickness of the sponge. But as it turned out, there were others. Firstly, the 2.2mm sponge's top sheet was tacky. The 2mm sponge's top sheet wasn't. Could this be the reason the 2mm sponge has a shallower and faster trajectory than the 2.2mm one? Here is film I shot at 1000 frames per second. It shows the ball, which has been fed by me, bouncing up and making contact with the top sheets. You can see the angle the ball leaves the bat at is greater off the tacky surface, but the point of contact looks the same. The ball comes in, hits the rubber and bounces straight off. However, by slowing down the footage to 5% of its normal speed, watch again, and you can now see the ball making contact with the tacky top sheet, and visibly climbing up the top sheet surface before it rebounds off again. It seems like the tacky surface causes a greater dwell time. So the ball leaving the non-tacky surface already has a head start in terms of speed. Sort of like the advantage gained from jumping the gun in a sprint race. And this climbing effect from the tacky top sheet seems to generate a steeper throw angle. Shown here where you can see the trajectory of two balls overlaid on top of each one. And the ball from the tacky top sheet stays higher than that from the non-tacky one. But is it the tacky top sheet which is responsible for the steeper trajectory and slower speed? Not necessarily. I repeated this test a few times for both the tacky and non-tacky top sheets and found that the non-tacky tap sheet generated this climbing effect 15.38% of the time, whilst even the tacky top sheet only managed it 40% of the time. And on those occasions where the ball didn't climb up by the top sheet, the ball still left the top sheet with the 2.2mm sponge at a higher angle. The second difference between these two sponge versions was the sponge hardness. The 2.2mm sponge hardness was stamped by Giant Dragon as being 46 degrees, whilst the 2mm version was only 44 degrees. Fortunately, I still have an old sheet of 2.2mm max spin with a 44 degree hard sponge, which also has a tacky top sheet. So now the sponge thickness and tacky top sheet are the same, the only difference is the sponge hardness. So once again I repeated the test. This time, the climbing success rate increased to 64.29% for the 44 degree sponge, compared to just 40% for the 46 degree sponge. So now it seems like it's a combination of the tacky top sheet and the softer sponge which is causing this climbing effect. Not necessarily, not in our tests. I also tested old sheets of Donic Desto F3 Big Slam and Jiwoo Proton XP450 Turbo. The F3 Big Slam has a 1.8mm sponge which according to the one of a kind sponge hardness table has a hardness of 35 degrees. The Proton XP450 has a 2mm sponge which Jiwoo lists as having a 45 degree hardness. As neither of these rubbers has a tacky top sheet, 
I was expecting the climbing effect success rate to be minimal, similar to the 2mm 44 degree version of the Max Spin. But again I was wrong. The Proton XB had a climbing success rate of 60%, similar to the 44 degree tacky top sheeted Max Spin, whilst the F3 Big Slam returned a massive success rate of 92.31%. The black F3 Big Slam, a soft, thin sponged, non tacky rubber, has the best climbing effect. That's totally different to the first results which we could have put out here. The next two most successful rubbers, the Proton XP and the Black Max Spin, had different top sheets, tacky versus non-tacky, and sponge thicknesses. So it would seem like it's a sponge hardness and not the tacky top sheet which has a major impact on this climbing effect that we've seen. Is it? No. Not in our tests. The worst performing rubber in this test was the red 2mm non-tacky giant Max Spin with a sponge thickness of 2mm and hardness of 44 degrees. That's virtually identical specs to the Proton XP. And really should have returned very similar results. So what can we conclude from our climbing results? Like most of our tests, they come with a caveat. We don't carry them out in laboratory conditions, so there's room for variations in the tests that we do, and we don't repeat them often enough to be able to come out and say for a fact that everything will happen this way in these circumstances. But hopefully our results have raised some questions and they've confused you. We started off thinking it was a tacky top sheet that was causing the climbing effect and we've ended up with only one consistent thing and that's the colour of the actual rubbers. Those rubbers which generated this climbing effect the most often were all black. You may be asking why did we just go through that last section looking at climbing results? Well it was done to demonstrate something. In our experience of testing table tennis equipment it's dangerous to identify just one or possibly two factors which can have an impact on how those rubbers perform. There are lots of other factors which interact with them. Unless you consider all those factors, your results are going to be skewed in some way. When you look at how inverted rubbers with sponge are made up, there are just so many different aspects to them. Sponge thickness, hardness and weight. Top sheet tackiness, thickness and hardness. The pimple structure and size underneath that top sheet the type of glue used, the blade, bat or paddle, and the elasticity of the sponge and top sheet. Each and every one of these properties and others interacts together and because of this there are multiple permutations to consider. If you try and isolate one property you risk losing the relevance of those tests because when combined with another property the results may be completely different. And that makes both testing and making rules to give the performance of table tennis equipment extremely difficult because if you don't factor in all these different elements you could end up bringing in rules and regulations which don't have the effect that you want. There is a saying The whole is something else than the sum of its parts and in our experience this is especially true of table tennis rubbers. And our results also show how much at the mercy of the manufacturers table tennis players are. If there's not the consistency in the manufacture of these rubbers or consistency in the testing of these rubbers then you're going to have to change the way you play your shots. It might only be a little bit, but you're still going to have to change. Should you have to? I don't know. But where does this leave all our results? Well, regrettably, we can only make general conclusions, which, after nearly 10 months of filming and putting this all together, is, to say the least, a little bit frustrating. But that's all we can do. And what we come out with is that there is a difference in the robot tests between the 2.2mm sponge version of Giant Dragon Max Spin and the 2mm version. But we've also not covered one essential aspect, and that is you. You control, amongst other things, the speed, direction and angle of impact. But we'll put that right in the third video in this series, when we introduce human testing. We asked four players of differing ability and experience to try out both the 2 and 2.2mm sponge versions of Giant Dragon's Max Spin using the same blade, and then to give us their impressions. Impressions, as it turns out, which were quite surprising. Can't be. No, can't be. Thank you for watching.